And now is that coming across clearly? Yeah, perfect. Presentation, good. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you for this opportunity to present some of our findings from the archeological investigations in Rabati in Southwest Georgia. Our Gaia project is in collaboration involving archeologists from the National Museum in Georgia and the University of Melbourne. Yeah, let me do that in a second. Oh. Uh, oh, there we are. When we read the themes of the conference, we felt the issues were central to our project aims, namely to construct a more precise absolute chronology for the early Bronze Age and the early Korgan period, to create a more nuanced understanding of the archaeological cultures in the late Kuraraxis and later Markopi, Bedeni and Triolenti periods, to identify and define regional and chronological variations, to contribute a new suite of radiocarbon dates, stratigraphic evidence and associated typological definitions of cultural artifacts, and to construct a new narrative for this dynamic time. And we're making he uh, headway in all aspects. By now, many of you will know about Rabati, and indeed, some of you have visited us at various times. So briefly, Rabati is a fortified artificial mound situated in Svali village on the northern edge of the Erisheti mountain overlooking the Kura Valley at an altitude of 1,480 metres above sea level. And here's the site of Rabati, and I'll also touch on the site of Chobareti, which is very close by. The closest main towns are Ahalsike to the west and Aspinza to the east. Along the northern edge of the site, there is a substantial fortification wall, which probably once encircled the summit. In this slide, you can see the surviving fortification walls and the general situation on the plateau. Here is a view from the site of Rabati looking west. And you can see how close Chobaretti is to the site where we're excavating now. Uh, Rabati was first investigated by Georgian archaeologists in the 1970s. Three Gaia excavation seasons were held in 2016 and 2018, and also in 2019. And COVID restrictions permitting, we hope to get back there in 2022. Three areas have been targeted so far to determine the stratigraphic depth and chronological potential of the site. A long-term plan is to have extensive horizontal exposures over the site to capture these settlement plans. This aspect is becoming increasingly important because of, of the substantial early Korgan Bedeni phase deposits close to the surface. In this aerial slide, we have outlined the two locations where Bedeni deposits are located, uh, D, E and E 9 and 10, and A, B 10 and 11 over here. In this slide, it gives you the possible and known periods represented at the site. We have a few tenuous indications of a possible Neolithic presence, and you can compare the top shirt here to uh, material that's been found at Aruklo in the Kura project. We are quite certain that in the, we have calcolithic remains here. Uh, uh, and those fragments are very similar to those calcolithic examples from Ochozhani, which is near the Turkish Georgian border, southwest of Ahalsike. It's only about 30 kilometers from where we are. Unmistakable Bedeni uh, levels are also now firmly fixed through radiocarbon date. And of course, we have early Bronze Age as well, the Kuraxis material. There are pockets of late Bronze Age material and also Iron Age. And we also have um, extent, uh, quite a lot of uh, medieval material as well as, as architecture. Totally unexpected was the substantial and non-domestic Kuraraxis architecture at Rabati. Here you can see a large stone building with corridors. We have reached the floor level in the corridors and the pottery is unmistakably Kuraraxis. 
But any period deposits, however, were encountered just under the modern surface and over the Kuroraxi's architecture. Some spots have been disturbed by medieval activities, such as the round stone line feature here, which had cut into the lower walls. There is no evidence of Bedeni activities inside the Kuroraxi's structure. It would seem that when the Bedeni community settled there, the building had been abandoned. In this trench, the Bedeni deposits consisted predominantly of plaster habitation surfaces over the Kuroraxi's architecture. So here you can see the Bedeni surface and you can see how deep the deposit is through the section there. And it's this sector here that you're just seeing in the slide. And it was covered further, uh, but it's been excavated. And this piece was left to demonstrate the connection between the two levels. A thick Bedeni deposit, including many pottery fragments, were uncovered in trenches D10 and D9. Here is an aerial view of the excavation as it was in 2019. Apart from plastered habitation layers, there are also fragments of fire installation built of clay, and there are also pits. Significant uh, Bedeni areas are outlined here in red. This slide illustrates the medieval remains, architecture, paving, and a well-worn mortar. And the arrows pointing up to the top section there. Only half of a circular, uh, sorry, in today, the D9.4 trench has the deepest stratigraphical section because of the Soviet era excavations and some more recent uh, disturbances. In 2016 and 2018, this trench was cleaned and slightly enlarged. To the, to the north, the old and narrow te uh, test trench, which sat, sat directly on top of the pit, is still visible in the section. And here you can see the old test pit uh, here. And there was a pit underneath. Only half of a circular clay structure labeled uh, Locus 550 survived as it was disturbed by modern activities. That's up here in this area here. The carbon-14 reading dated the deposit to 2342 to 2018 BC, which suggests that this feature belongs to the Bedeni period. But it would seem to be contemporary with the Kuroraxi's remains, because it's almost at the same level in this trench. The Kuroraxi's deposit appears to be about a depth, at a depth of about 2.5 metres from the modern surface, and it is separated from the Bedeni level by a distinct burnt reddish yellow sandy clay layer marked as locus 523 in the slide. And we're talking about this, this yellowish color here, uh, separating the Bedeni period from the Kururux. The undetermined wall marked in the photo must belong either to the Bedeni phase, to the late Kururux, or to the early established Kururux period. Any one of these options poses interesting and unexpected possibilities. So here's the undetermined wall here. We're not, we have to excavate further to try and clarify what's going on there. In D9.2, immediately to the east, proved to be largely free of disturbance to the Bedeni plaster uh, habitation surfaces and pits. We will return to this sector later, as the finds here reflect on the economic strategies of the Bedeni period, namely a clear textile industry that may have had a commercial aspect. 20 radiocarbon samples sent, uh, from the central and western areas of Rabati were analysed in two laboratories, Waikato in New Zealand and Poznan in Poland. The three Kuroraxi samples taken from the floor of the large building uh, were in a, from the floor and the associated areas. The details can be found in our radiocarbon article as indicated in the top left corner. The Bedeni dates uh, from both D9 and the B, AB1011 sectors form a satisfyingly consistent range conforming to the chronological span noted at other sites in the Caucasus. 
At Rabati, they span from about 2,466 to 1,864 BC. Turning now to the cultural remains. Of the early Bronze Age finds at the site, we have typical Kururuxi's forms, both impressed and relief linear decoration. Signs of controlled firing, producing the classic red black hues and shapes such as the handle and tall neck jar shown in the lower part of the slide. There are indications from the finds that we may be able to chart the evolution of cultural trends through the transitional from the early Bronze Age to the early Kurgan periods, especially for the pottery forms. For example, this squat pot, which is late early Bronze Age form. Only a few fragments hint at traditional types, uh, transitional types and possibly Matkopi fragments. Unequivocal now is the character of the Bedeni pottery range. A small amount of fine wares came from D9 trench. They are usually better finished, black burnished, distinctive Bedeni tankards with the knee bend handles. A detailed preliminary report of the ceramic finds was published in 2019. All finds from Rabati are being given equal attention in our investigations and reports. While it may be too early to speak of the true function of certain areas of the site, Area D9 had wares associated with foodways, cooking and dining. The range of cooking ware shapes is limited, falling within our category of common wares. They are found in deposits rich in organic material which coats and stains the pottery. Typical shapes include baggy, deep and open pots, often with loop handles, cut or folded rims to neaten the lip, such as the two on the right hand side. Some have slightly flaring rings, like the one on the top left. Other shapes are few in number, such as the cup in the lower left. Clay hues uh, usually are in the pale to mid-brown range, but some very dark examples approach the dark surface of the better quality but any fine wares. We would like to turn to some aspects of our research stemming from these finds. It seems to us that even though Rabati might have had a break between the Kuruxis and the Bedeni phases, we can still detect signs of some cultural continuity in the finds. And I'm interested in the, uh, the comments that have been uh, made in the previous papers that the, um, along a similar vein that we're seeing continuity with the Kuruxis in the later period. Noteworthy is the con continuing use of trays. Their presence in the Calcolithic context in Caucasus has been well charted, such as the two on the left-hand side from Berakul Debi and also from Ahal Sike, um, uh, from the Museum of Ahal Sike, which came from Ochozani. They were, uh, they were also found in early Bronze Age contexts, um, such as uh, uh, some were found in Buyuk Tepi Huyuk in Turkey, others at Sos Huyuk, and we've also found some in, or many, in Chobaretti, such as the middle picture. And this middle one is quite interesting because it's the only example that I know of that has red slip on the interior. And it comes from house six, which is a later context of the early Bronze Age at Chobaretti. And I think whoever made it was trying to copy the red black pottery that started to appear at that point. And we also have found now in Bedeni context, similar trays, such as the one on the right hand side. Indeed, this example from Rabati is extremely large, measuring some 80 centimeters, uh, sorry, 70 centimeters across. This example has the familiar qualities enduring through the centuries. Extremely thin base, rough resting surface, shallow side walls, incurved back, um, a distinctly scooped front and poorly finished exterior with a better finished interior. Hars and andines are another enduring form. They are a hallmark of the Kuruxi's uh, culture carrying through into the Bedeni phase, what, but with some evolution of shape and decoration. From Bedeni context at Rabati came a triangular hearth prop in the top right picture here. 
similar in form uh, to those found in in-ground hearths at uh, we found in uh, Sosuyuk in the bottom right. Decoration of ram's horns are known in early Bronze Age contexts from Aragats in Armenia and from survey work in Sosuyuk, such as the middle um, lower picture. Note the punctured eyes on the Rabati example in the top uh, right. This amazing twin anthropomorphic object was probably connected to a hearth or fire installation. In this case, subsidian uh, fragments have been inserted into the clay representing eyes. It was found in the 1970s excavations, but in an area that can now be firmly associated with the Badeni period. It is akin, akin to fixtures on fire installations found at Berical Debi, pictured here. Berical Debi lies 62 kilometers northeast of Rabati. Another enigmatic form is illustrated here. Some unusual fragments were first noted in 2018 season. Seemingly shaped like a capital B placed on its side, it was not obvious how and to what kind of vessels these were joined. At first, it was thought that they might be a variant of the double loop handles seen on the Natsagora jar, pictured in the lower middle. Decoration is limited to wavy and straight ridges and small knobs applied to the back of the objects. With the discovery of a more complete vessel in 2019, it became clear that they were horizontal double and sometimes triple looped bridge handles supported by a small internal pillar of clay. This intriguing vessel form was embellished on the handle top with three knobs near the bowl rim and two on its outer end. The bowl had repeated cuts or notches around the rim in the style more typical of the Calcolithic Sioni vessels. Until confirmed by absolute dates, there was the possibility that the cut rim fragments of this nature which had been appearing in the pottery bags, were possibly of Calcolithic date. But this vessel is made from Bedeni common ware, and it came from clear confirmed Bedeni context. An approximate parallel is this unusual object from Berical Debi. Three points of similarity link the two vessels. First, the overall open bowl-like shape. Second, the five knobs applied near the rim on the Berical Derby example, and the five knobs applied near over the top of the ha bridge handle on the Rabati example. And third, the odd horizontal stand stance of the handles on both. The Berical Derby handle, especially the tight bent uh, outer end, suggests that the object was stored hanging up. Could this be how the Rabati examples were stored and displayed in early Kogan? Uh, dwellings. Gia Chilingarashvili alerted us to another example in the Ahalseke Museum, which also came to uh, from the Rabati settlement during the early uh, Georgian fieldwork there, and it's pictured in the lower left. If we accept the possibility that the Kuraxis folk persisted but transformed themselves and evolved then another possible pottery link might tie between the unusual uh, bridge handle vessels and the pottery scoop form shown in the upper left corner. There are two ways of looking at the link, the shape and the as yet unknown function. Of the shape, both forms are similar, shallow open bowls with unusual handle position. Both handles are fitted to the side and unlike the usual attachment of the Kuraxi's handle, to other pots, the scoop handles are pushed in or recessed into the bowl, as you can see here and here. For me, the linchpin uh, between the types came with the Imris Rakar uh, site, which Gia Chingalashvili excavated recently. He found a fascinating hybrid form in a pit dated to the Bedeni phase. And we're very grateful his, for his permission to show the example here in the bottom left of the slide. And you can hear the shape of this almost scoop-like is mirroring what's happening in the Koraxis period. Of course, 
The strongest link between the Kuroaxis and later Bedeni period are the large jars with face designs from the Ananuri Korgans one and three and from the Badani settlement. We are addressing these issues of cultural continuity, adaption and evolution in forthcoming publications, but we thought it might be worth floating this possibility in this forum. If we factor in the genetic studies of ancient communities in the region, which suggest a fairly constant genetic, genetic fo footprint for the population in the Caucasus, from the early Bronze Age to the Iron Age at least, then trying to identify what happened to the Kuroxis people becomes a pressing and important issue. Finally, we would like to briefly touch on the Rabati textile industry for which we have compelling evidence. Area D9 appears to have been an open air zone and here 146 uh, um, bone tools and 11 cylindrical loom weights indicate clear textile production, both spinning and weaving and possibly the dyeing of cloth. The loom weights pictured here are of a type generally associated with uh, upright looms. Non-pollen polynomorph analysis carried out on soil samples and on the tools themselves by Inga Matkoplishvili in the National Museum in Tbilisi identified flax, hemp and cotton. Wool was rare with only one fibre present and this had no twist to suggest that it had been processed into yarn. Dyed fibres included yellow, pink, blue and purple. Some fibres were a blend of hemp and flax, indicating experimentation of the text by the textile manufacturers. Notable among the textile, te uh, textile fibres documented uh, in the Rabati settlement is cotton. Unlike flax and hemp, cotton has not been observed previously in Bedetti contexts. The earliest evidence for this fibre comes in the Southern Caucasus and is known from the late Bronze Age Safar Karaba uh, Kurgans dated to the 15th and 14th century BC. In the Northern Caucasus, however, the evidence for cotton-like fiber is documented as early as the fourth millennium BC in the Novosnovodnaya Kurgan. Local cultivation of cotton in the Rabati region should be discounted due to environmental conditions that were not suited to its cultivation. Hence, the present of, presence of cotton as an important material could reflect on aspects of long distance trade, prestige items, social display, and so on. We already know that the Kuroxis period, that textile experimentation had, um, had created specialized textile techniques that we now take for granted, notably two needle knitting, and less commonly used was cross knit looping made with a robust eyed needle, such as the one in the lower middle. But both of these were groundbreaking uh, advances in textile technology as significant as those made in metallurgy. In Chabaretti, in the NPP analysis, it has identified hemp and flax fibers and one of the knitting impressions uh, shown here in the top uh, center also came from Chabaretti. But we also do know of uh, the um, cross knit looping, which is made with the eyed needle ha has occurred much earlier than um, even the Kuroxis period. But it's interesting that it was also carried right through into these um, Bedeni period as well. You can see in this slide the distribution of large numbers of textile tools across D9 trench. Aside from the sheer numbers of the bone tool, textile tools collected in D9, we found a few possible scale pan weights in the same context, which might indicate commercial as opposed to household um, um, activity. But we need to, much more information to make any firm conclusions about the scale of manufacturing. It is likely that flax was grown locally as food crops were also evident in the Bedeni context as determined by Catherine Longford. It seemed clear that the community were living there permanently, tied to agricultural, agriculture as part of their economic strategies. This doesn't discount the possibility that some groups in the region or even within the Rabati community itself 
were, mo were more mobile. We keep returning to the question, what happened to the Kuratsis community at the end of the Bronze Age? The answers we believe will not lie in broad, all encompassing narratives, but in close studies of regional pockets and site by site evidence. Despite shifting and evolving cultural trends, it seems that a stable population inhabited the region who held on to core traditions. Thank you.